We're gonna, um, we're gonna continue with the closeout series tonight. And we're gonna be um, talking about this phenomena or this deal that, by the way, Stacy, you're sitting in the wrong place. <laughs> Would you please move over here? <laughs> yeah. Man. I hate it when people sit in the wrong place in church. Sit down. How can I make fun of you all the way over there, man? So I feel better now. Do you? Oh, good. Good. Uh, he's, it's a phantom now. So anyway, uh, this closeout series, what we've been doing is talking about the stuff that we think is the most important stuff we've learned in the last year. And the piece of this I want to get into tonight is about how when we come to a place like this, when we're in the middle of a crisis in our lives, we're in the middle of um, having stuff going on that, that is either an addiction or a compulsion or somewhere in between that we're really struggling with, it's really getting the best of us. And we know, we know that help is needed. How do you begin to see that it's, it, it starts with me? You know, it ultimately doesn't start with you, it starts with me. And being on the other side of chemical addiction as a, as a family member, that, uh, that piece of this was rugged to get to. I mean, I did not, it took me a long time to, to, to come to terms with the fact that when I was going to Al-Anon, I was actually going there for my st myself and my own stuff. You know, I wanted to believe that what had kept me motivated to go for a long time was that I believed that I was going there for the alcoholic. And I was going there to learn techniques about how to manage the alcoholic. And if I could just go enough, I would learn enough techniques and I would be able to get control of it for her and then I would be able to help her, which is what, as a good classic codependent, I desperately wanted to do. You know, I really didn't, it didn't dawn on me that she might be able to deal with her own addiction. It dawned on me that that was my job and I was going to figure out some way to fix it. That's not an unusual story. What we're going to talk about tonight is not an unusual um, reaction to the way we handle stuff in our lives, is it? We love it when someone says, how'd that happen? And we go, they went that away, you know? You can see it happen every day, you know, probably in your job, you can see it happen every day at work, can't you? Something goes wrong at work, what happens? Everyone looks around for somebody else they can sort of talk about that was responsible for how this happened. Am I right? How'd that happen? Well, I mean, you learned that as a little kid. You know, you sell out, I come from a big family, <laughs> I mean, you sell out your siblings right away. It doesn't matter if it's true, it just matters if someone will believe it. And that's how you do it, isn't it? And man, there is stuff that one of the hardest things, I honestly, I don't know about you guys, but I honestly believe that one of the hardest things about recovery is what we're gonna talk about tonight, right? Can I take responsibility for myself? Can I own my own actions? Can I own my own feelings? Can I say, for just for today, I'm going to work on my stuff? Not what she said, not what they did, not how they did, not how they didn't, not where they are, not what they're doing, not what they're not doing, but where am I in this is the question. Where am I in this? You know, and it's, it's a big deal. When does it finally become about me? So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to ask Larry Carroll to come up here, and he's going to talk about kind of how he got to a place of beginning to deal with that question. Have a seat, man. You doing all right? Just wonderful, Mark. Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. This could really be a disaster. You know, it really could be. <laughs> if the two of us lose this completely and it like gets the time keeps rolling on just like wave your hand or something and go boys we got to move on all right because we got communion stuff tonight and Vic you'll get mad if we're late so help us all right go ahead what you're supposed to ask me questions that was my question is tech talk to me about as as you had a point in your life where you came to terms with the fact that you had work to do for yourself okay. in recovery how'd you get there <clears throat> I got involved with recovery uh, as one of the pastors at First Methodist in Maryville. And we, uh, you know, I think Brent and I are, are 
primary concern was our daughter, uh, who has, uh, for many, many years, struggled with uh, a variety of addictions. I think it was really uh, something that started somewhere in her teens and uh, really manifested itself while she was in college and uh, became a real critical, uh, you know, a little bit later on. And uh, somewhere during the 12 steps, I began to realize that, hey, you know, this stuff is pretty good. Uh, as I was studying the 12 steps, and I'm going, this, this really relates to, to everybody. And then I became to realize that everybody's got something about which they need to, to recover, over which they need to recover. So <clears throat> it became apparent to me, and I know that you'll find this is a real shocker, uh, Mark, that uh, pastors are notoriously codependent. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I think a lot of times that's, uh, you know, God calls the codependent into ministry. Uh, but, you know, part of our deal is that, is that we want to be liked. We want everything to be kind of even keel. We want everything to run smoothly. And when things don't, we try to fix it immediately and we'll do whatever we can to make that happen. And that's kind of the way it was uh, with, for Brenda and myself with, with Lauren. Perhaps more me than it was Brenda and <clears throat> my wife, Brenda. So I, I came to realize that, uh, you know, I'm the one <laughs> that has the problem. Uh, and it wasn't just Lauren, even though she had the problem, it was really me that was exacerbating the problem, it was making it worse, it was making Lauren worse because she really didn't have to deal with anything. Uh, I always, uh, you know, I always looked at her as the one that was being victimized. And of course, she relishes that role uh, that she was being victimized. It was always somebody else's fault. And so, you know, I, I need to try to somehow fix all of that. And it became real apparent to me after a while that um, I couldn't fix it. I can't fix her. Um, I really can't fix myself. It's only by the grace of God that I'm able to do anything that I do. Um, so, you know, I'm the one that really needs recovery. And when I started getting involved with this uh, community, um, you know, I just realized that, uh, you know, here is a place where people can be so unguarded in what they say and what they think and what they feel, and they can say it with a complete honesty and, and, a, and a group of people that are going to accept you and love you no matter who you are, where you are in the journey. Uh, I was really kind of blown away the first worship experience that I, I came to where uh, somebody stood up and said, I think it may have been Clay, stood up and said, uh, my name is Clay, uh, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I struggle with whatever. Uh, I said, man, I mean, they're just... They, they name the higher power. They're not defined by their struggle. They're defined as a follower of Jesus. So they claim the higher power. And I said, man, this is a place for me. And I don't know how the rest of you feel about that, but I tell you what, this is truly a place of healing. And when, it, when, it, when I began to claim my own illness, my own uh, struggle, uh, and my own codependency, my own compulsive behavior, uh, then the healing began. And I felt a peace that I tell you at 41 years of ministry that I had never really felt before. So I praise God for that. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. What, um, was it ever going to be possible, do you think, for you to be like free until you got to seeing that, that was, uh, it was really about you? Well, you know, at the time, I wasn't really sure how that was going to work out. Uh, actually, I'm not really sure what you mean by the question, but <clears throat> that's, uh, that's pretty typical of the way we communicate. Um, <laughs> yeah, it kind of is, really. I mean, what I want to know, what I want to know is, is, is the longer your focus was on somebody else, regardless, wasn't it true that there was no possible way that God was going to break through? Right, absolutely. I mean, uh, that was a defense mechanism for me. Right. Um, you know, it was, uh, if it was always on somebody else's shoulders, then I didn't really have to deal with me. I mean, that's, 
And, you know, I don't know, you know, and, and Lauren is the same way. I mean, she could always blame somebody else. She could blame me and Brenda. She could blame anybody else. And I was kind of doing the same thing. Um, but uh, uh, with different things, different addictions, different uh, uh, things that, that, that I needed uh, to deal with in recovery. So, man, it was when I came to realize that, that it really is about me and, um, and allowing God to work with me on that and one-to-one and in, in this community, I mean, it's not just one-to-one, but in this community is when I began to, to sense this peace, this sense of uh, uh, wholeness, this sense of completeness. The Hebrews call it shalom. I mean, that's what it really means. It's, it's about uh, being made whole again and uh, the freedom that uh, one experiences and all of that. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming up here, man. Appreciate it. You finished with me now? Done. Okay. You know, uh, if you're going to ask that question, when does you know when does it become about me? I mean, the answer to the question's pretty pretty stark. It's like it becomes about you right away. You know, if you want to get free, it becomes about you right away. And if I could, like, if I could encourage you to take that shortcut spiritually and emotionally to say this is going to become about me right away, I would really encourage you to do that. You know, that's coming from a guy who um, failed at that a long, long time and really zeroed in on children zeroed in on a spouse zeroed in on a lot of other stuff other than other than me you know and begot, and got progressively sicker along the way for me and um boy you know if i can encourage you to not travel down that path any longer than you have to that would be a victory tonight that would be that would be a good thing you know the truth of it is you can be here tonight and and you can have an alcoholic in your life or an addict or someone who's dealing with pornography and you can continue to say to yourself all you want to listen the only thing that's really got to happen is if um is if he would just change or if she would just change or if they would just recover or if they would just get sober and you probably don't believe me tonight and you probably don't believe larry And I get that because I didn't believe anybody either. But I'm here to tell you that if that happened with this person in your life who was the compulsive or the addict, you would remain as sick as you are right now tonight. And you will simply transfer your anxiety level over to someplace else because you'll be looking around. It's like someone was saying in the discernment group this week, you know, like like for a codependent, they're the object of their codependency is like alcohol to an alcoholic. You getting that? And so if you take away the object of their, of their dependency, which is the person that they're trying the most to fix, it is absolutely chaotic for that person when that's no longer available. Are you tracking with that? It is chaotic. That is what we're trying to avoid. We know what it's just like in family systems. In family systems, here's the way it works. If you're in a family of, of, you know, if you're in a family, this is kind of how it goes. You have a couple of siblings or whatever. In every family, there is somebody that's called the identified patient. Another way of talking about that is the black sheep. Some of you might be enjoying the lovely dynamic of being the black sheep in your family. Just guessing that that could be possible. And if you are, you know what it feels like, right? You know that no matter what you do, you really can't do anything right, or at least that's the way it feels. Well, here's what ha- here's a, a problem in families is what happens when the black sheep or the identified patient in the family gets better. In the rest of the family with no recovery, I will guarantee you one thing will happen, and that is everybody else will get worse. Like if you're married to somebody and they're in the process of getting sober and you're not going to Al-Anon a lot and you're not going to family support a lot and you're sitting around and you're like, I'm going to applaud him, I'm going to applaud her, I'm going to pat him on the head and say, you're doing a great job, I'm so proud of you and you think that's going to get it, it won't. There are going to be all kinds of issues going forward because now you're in this. And I mean, I know for me, look, I resented to no end the fact that this disease of of addiction had made me sick as well. I never thought that was a great idea. I didn't want that to happen. But you know what? It did. And as I've learned in my life, 
more and more and more about my own recovery, I have seen where the reason that all that started happening to me and the way I handled it goes all way back before the alcoholic ever started being the alcoholic in my life. I was like fully available to this, ready to be a train wreck from way before any of that ever happened. That's part of what this is all about, is the gift of freedom only is the gift of freedom when I take it for myself. So the answer to the question is, when is it about me is right away. You know, what makes it necessary that our recovery is our recovery? In other words, what makes it necessary that I don't work on his recovery and you don't work on mine, which is a great, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure at least one or two people in here have tried this, but you got to admit, it is so much more fun for me to work on yours. Amen? Man, I mean, I'm a freaking genius when it comes to your recovery. This is what you really ought to do. This is how you really ought to do it. This is what I would do if I was you because I'm not you, and so it's so much more fun for me to tell you exactly how to do it. People are forever calling me up. I don't like my sponsor. Why don't you like them? Well, I mean, they won't tell me how to do it. They're a pretty good sponsor. Keep them. I know, but they're like trying to make me do it. They're making me call them. They don't even call me up. They don't even pay attention to me. It's like, right? They're not working your program for you. Hate that. I mean, it's so much more fun to work somebody else's program. How you should do it and what you should do and what you should think and where you should go and how many times you should and go. If someone said, and like, what about you? you you're going to want to go, well, man, look, at, we're really not talking about me right now. I mean, I'm totally focused on her. <laughs> and I'm having a really good time, too, because there's a lot to focus on. Thing is, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about how much stuff that you want to tell somebody else about is even maybe subconsciously, I don't know how to explain this, but is, do you not get the sense sometimes that when you're talking about somebody else, God is literally yelling in your ear going, hey, I'm really talking to you about you. While you're saying that out of your mouth about them, that is really you, star, that we're talking about. I hate that, man. But it's true, isn't it? It's true that God has given us opportunities to see it in a way that's healthy. Experience, strength, and hope works like this. I've got to recognize for me that my liability is my liability. My liability in my life isn't your liability, and you didn't give my liability to me. I gave my liability to him because I'm just a broken guy. Just spiritually, that's just true, isn't it? You know, it's not like if I could, it's like saying, listen, I mean, we people have tried this in the church to go, well, in the church, I'm just gonna hang around Christians. I mean, I'm gonna only be with Christians. I'm gonna go to, my kids are gonna go to Christian school. I'm gonna spend 80% of my time in church. I'm gonna go to every Bible study they offer. I don't want to make it anybody else in the world. If they're not a Christian, I don't wanna be with them because that makes, makes them evil. And I'm only gonna do Christian things. I go to Christian movies, Christian this, Christian that. It ain't gonna work. Because I don't believe I have a liability. The first step in the truth of it is, I gotta say out loud, sooner or later in my life, I am a sinner. I am a broken person. I do not have it all together. I do not have my act together. It doesn't matter how many Bible studies I go to, it's still true. It's like, if you go to 71 Bible studies this year, the sin will be completely off of you and God will just go, perfect. You get little stars on yourself, you know, like when you go to Sunday school, 81 years in a row. I never liked those creepy little kids. I thought they were weird. I mean, if you can't skip Sunday school growing up once in a while, you're some kind of psycho. I mean, you got, I don't care. I mean, those guys walk around with little, this one kid used to walk around with a book. I bet he's some kind of freaky little undertaker now. I don't know what he is, but he would walk around with a book on Sunday. I, I've had, you know, that kid would like, one time he won an award for being like going to Sunday school five years in a row. Who knows what he is now? He's some kind of yak farmer out in Oklahoma. I don't know what he is. But the thing that scares me about that boy is, does he really think he's a sinner? Because that's what this conversation is about, isn't it? Spiritually is, is look, I'm no different than anybody else. 
And we, you know, we sit there and we start recovery programs. We have learned that our biggest problem in recovery programs is getting leaders to admit that the recovery program is for them. They're like, why do you, I mean, I didn't, I never, it never dawned on me that someone would wear a name tag at our, our recovery ministry because they were trying to say to other people, I'm not really one of those people that come to the room. I want to point out that I'm not messed up and the rest of these psychos are. <laughs> it never occurred to me someone would be that warped in their thinking, I'm going to take the dang things away now. <laughs> I'm going to make us put on the bottom of it, Mark, recovery of Cokesbury, psycho, right there in the end. Hey. Eh? We're about to give some away to those guys in Dayton when they start. By the way, they're watching right now. Hello, Chad. You're the chief psycho. I'm just telling you. But I mean, it never occurred to me you would take a name tag to kind of go, I'm not one of those messed up people. I'm just here to serve them dinner. It's like, you're kidding me, man. You can't receive the asset of Jesus until you recognize your own liability because you will continue to try to be your own savior and your own God in one way or another. Not only that, but until you start to work your own program, you're gonna be this for the person that, that you're around. You're gonna be fuel on the fire. Like I cannot guarantee you that if you work your own program, the person in your life is gonna automatically get better. I don't know that. That's up to them. But I will guarantee you that as long as you don't work your own program and do your own work of recovery, that the person in your life that, you're, that is, you're related to or whatever, your friend, your wife, your husband, your mom, your dad, sister, brother, I will guarantee you they will not get better until you start to work on your own stuff. Guarantee it. Because they cannot live up, they cannot live up to that sense of your own perfection. You have no connection to them at all. We gotta learn to have clean relationships where I own me and you own you. Where I own me, are you hearing me? Where I own me and you own you. And you're gonna do what you're gonna do and I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. And we're gonna keep those relationships clean. It starts for all of us with powerlessness. This is what we don't like. If, if I believe you're my problem, I don't have to be powerless, do I? If you're my problem, I believe that I have the power to change you. The hardest day is to go get to that place of going, I don't have the power to change anybody. I do not have the power to change people, places, or things. And listen, man, when it comes to the people side of this, look, at, I like to believe, I mean, I really do like to believe that I'm a fairly... Um, persuasive person. And that learning right there has been very challenging for me to say out loud in my own recovery that I am powerless over what other people are gonna do. Like, that has been one of the hardest pieces for me that has gone way beyond, way beyond anything to do with the alcoholic in my life, right to Mark Beebe. And I've been working on that forever to realize that I do not have the power to change the way people see stuff. I mean, I can lay it out there for you. I can show you. I can put it up on a board. I can explain it. I can be enthusiastic. But in the end of the day, you're going to do what you're going to do. You're going to do what you're going to do. Powerlessness is where it starts. Second piece of us being able to do some self-examination with ourselves is we got to realize who we are. We got to realize that you, in order to get into this all the way, you got to go, I know that every day I'm starting off knowing that I'm a child of God. I got to know every day that Jesus died for me, whether I even believe in him or not, I got to accept the fact that Jesus died for me. I got to know that I have value and worth and meaning regardless of what happens to me on that day. And therefore, I got to realize a very important thing. There is nothing I can share with God that is going to change the way that God loves me. Amen. Nothing. And that's when you start with some clean living. That's when you start with some clean, wide open and available living is when you go, I'm gonna stare, share stuff with God and nothing about that is gonna change the way that God sees me. Now, I might share that with my friend and I might change my friend's view of me entirely. But you know what? That's on my friend. My job is to tell the truth, isn't it? My job is to openly tell the truth to my friend. What my friend does, I don't have any control over because I'm powerless over my friend. So my identity is a big piece. Self-examination, the willingness to examine me, 
Not because of you, not you entering into it, not if you would just, not with you at all, just me, just me. Where am I, here's the question, where am I in this? Whatever it is. I gotta learn how to be fully available. I gotta learn how to be fully available to this work of working on me. Someone says to you, how's so-and-so doing? You say, you know, I don't really know how she's doing. I'm working on me. I'm working my own recovery. I know, but like, are they getting better? I mean, are they getting sober? You're gonna go, you know, I don't really know. You would need to ask them. I'm working on my recovery. I'm working on my program. I gotta work on me. Now, people are not gonna find that to be overly attractive. They're gonna go, they're gonna look at you and go, if they're not in recovery, this is, they're gonna go, well, that's insane. I mean, they're gonna go, good for you. They're gonna go, he's crazy. I would never do that, but good for you. Because I'm gonna tell you, what I'm talking about tonight outside of this room doesn't make a lot of sense to people. It's so much more attractive to blame somebody else, isn't it? That's just how we do it. That's the way we're wired, Adam and Eve. Well, actually, Eve told me I had to eat from that apple. And then Eve, well, actually, it was the snake. And then who, who knows what the snake blamed? Probably the yak farmer in Oklahoma. I don't know. I don't know. But you gotta be available. What's unavailable? Unavailability is when I close myself down to a willingness to let God begin to speak into my life and to show me, to show me who I am, to show me where I'm broken, to show me where the work is, to show me that what, what we're gonna do together, to show me what the construction project in my life looks like, to say to me, we gotta get a new foundation for you. Psalm 139 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. This is availability. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Man, to get to a place of security where you realize that God loves you enough for you to say to God, search me. Show me me. Show me what I need to learn. Show me where I'm broken. Show me what I'm really afraid about. Show me, God, what I'm running from. Show me, God, where the real pain is in my life that I'm trying to cover with any and everything else. Show me, God, what I think I'm, I'm failing at. Show me, God, how to start from right now where I am and take the next right step. And man, you know what? That right there, there's no church in America that can scare you into doing what I'm talking about. There's no threatening that. There's no going, you better do it or God's gonna get you. You know what, you know what I would plead for you about, about when it comes to God searching our hearts? I would plead for, for us that we would do it because of the love of Jesus, because of the blood of Jesus.